Okay, should we start? Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Welcome back to another episode of the Hell Money Podcast. I am your host, Casey Rodemore, with my co-host, Aaron Boop. I didn't censor it when you did it last time. Oh, okay, yeah. I yeah. just let them hear it. Okay. I yeah. feel like it's like an Easter egg. You okay, know? yeah, right. Okay. Like whoever yeah. listens to the podcast, like gets to know my name. Getting doxxed is an Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I feel like I just want to slowly, gradually undox, but not like too much at once. Right. Okay. To not like yeah. derail my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? I'm here with my co host, Aaron Boop, <laughs> who's a boop at the boop of boop, yeah. working on boop. So you'll have to listen to other episodes to find out those details. Yeah, fill in the puzzle You know what I pieces. mean? That's, yeah. that's, it's enough of like a, yeah. a it's treasure lore, hunt. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Totally. Um, welcome back. Yep. Welcome back. Uh, today we've got a variety of topics. Yeah, a variety. To grab bag. Little grab bag. Little grab bag. Um, little vibe check. Astrology. Science. Yep. Yep. Just all the good things. All the good things. Um, first, we have some announcements, though. Casey, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, they're, they're ordinal-related announcements. We've got ordinal-related <laughs> announcements. <laughs> for those who don't know, ordinals are a numeric namespace for Bitcoin. Uh, they are a system where you assign serial numbers, ordinal numbers, to every single Satoshi in the order that it was mined. And then you can pinpoint where these Satoshis are in the blockchain, mm-hmm. uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain specifically. It's not a token, it's not a second layer, it doesn't require any changes to Bitcoin. This is weird little thing, you know, that I cooked up. Um, so yeah, so uh, very boring topic, uh, very boring announcement, which is that the ordinal sync is now much, much faster. Oh, why? Yeah, uh, we just did a lot of optimization, um, thanks, thanks to uh, Ulrich Kalmeyer, who is uh, one of the collaborators on the project. He uh, just did some deep diving into uh, the patterns of UTXOs on Bitcoin being created and spent. His big um, insight was that it turns out that actually a huge number of UTXOs are spent the first block after in the same block as they're created. So Mm. a transaction creates an output and it's spent in that block for 20% of transaction outputs. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Um, And I'm, I'm not kind of sure what that is due to it's that that strikes me as quite a bit i would have thought that it was less or yeah less lesser are 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 created and spent in the same block and then once you get up to like i think like 18 blocks maybe uh 60 percent of utxos are created and spent within 18 blocks Hmm. so it seems like there's a lot of high frequency activity on bitcoin Mm -hmm. um so yeah anyways and he exploited that to add a fast in-memory cache that we check for UTXOs uh, when we're building the database. And this means that we don't have to go to the big, expensive, slow on-disk database uh, so often, which is a big, big win. Congratulations. So how long does it take now? It used to take like a day, right? Yeah, it used to take 28 hours, and we've gotten it down to like 11 hours and 50 minutes, I think. Cool. Yep. And I think we can also, we can actually get it to go a bit faster than that. There's still more low-hanging fruit. So our goal is to get it down to below eight hours. So that you like start it when you go to bed and when you wake up, it's done. Wow. That would be super nice. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> um, there also is a new uh, Ord wallet command, Ord wallet send. Okay. Actually lets you construct transactions that will send a specific ordinal in your wallet to another person. I thought you could do that already. Or um, was it just you had a wallet that knows what ordinals are? Uh, you kind of could do it already, but it was very manual. You had to like craft these transactions by hand using weird command line tools that aren't very user friendly. I see. Yep. And now anybody can just say, okay, ordinal like two, five, nine, nine, one, three, two, one. I want to send it to Bob whose address is X, Y, Z. And then the ordinal wallet will lovingly create a transaction where the inputs and outputs are ordered such that the ordinal that you want to get to its destination is sent to its destination. That's great. Yeah. Wow. It was pretty hard. <laughs> so I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of, a lot of things. It's really easy to fat finger ordinals into the void. Mm. Um, so a lot of things to check for and lots of tricky edge cases. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this wallet, uh, ord wallet send command will also let you participate in ordinal bounty three. Okay. Yep. So ordinal bounty three, uh, is for a total of 400,000 sats. It has two parts. Uh, one that's 200,000 sats and another that's, again, 200,000 sats. Mm-hmm. Uh, I made a word list of words and their frequency in the Google Books uh, corpus. So, like, Google has this, like, book scanning thing. They scan books, mm-hmm. you know, Google Books. 
um, and they're destructively scanned. So you, they actually, it's easier to like tear them apart as you're scanning them on these machines. So it's like a, it's a hellscape of books being ripped There's apart. There's some sort of poetic something there yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so they made kind, they have a, a list of all the words that appear in these books mm -hmm. that are, there are billions of them, maybe not billions of them and how often they appear. And so I built a word frequency list of all of the, uh, ordinal all of the words which are also valid ordinals so like 10 to 11 letters in length uh yeah to, yeah 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 10 uh, all they're all 11 uh characters in length so ordinals okay. ordinals oh, are right the sleepiest ordinal drops november 2023 so that'll be the I'm first press that you know that yeah <laughs> listen i'm planning a party yeah so the <laughs> ordinals are numbers but then there's also a mapping from numbers to names which are just uh strings of the characters a through z yeah so um, when i say sleepiest ordinal i mean that it's the first ordinal that's z z z z, z whatever 10, 10 z's because yeah. there's no 11 z's no yeah but there is 10 z's <clears throat> right. and that'll be the first 10 letter 10 character ordinal that's right which drops yep. in november yep i'm planning a slumber party incredible yeah, yeah pajama party it. slumber yeah, party yeah, yeah, for the yeah, sleepiest yeah. ordinal i love it yeah that sounds great <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the, the bounties are one, one half of the bounty is to is to submit an ordinal to the submission address mm -hmm. that, um, is the most common word on the list. So there's like a five week period two two and a half difficulty adjustment periods when the bounty is open. And the person who during that time submits the most common word wins 200,000 sats. Hmm. And then uh, also the other half of the bounty is the person who submits the least common word. Oh, well, yeah. so that, that still has to be a word. Still has to be a word on that okay. list. Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yep. And the reason I did that originally, I was going to make it, oh, you just have to submit the most common word. Right. But it turns out that most common words are incredibly boring. They're like information. And mm. like development and like all these really staid, boring uh, words. I mean, I would love to have the information ordinal. I mean, yeah, that's a flex. That Obviously, that's a flex. a flex. Yeah. But if you look at the other end of the list at the uncommon words, oh, they're more fun. fucking awesome. Yeah, they're yeah, like right. heresies and like crazy one time coinages that somebody made, you know? Okay. That is fun. Yeah. The, the, like the long tail. Hyper normalization. Hyper normalization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. Maybe I'll try to participate in the ordinal bounty. Three. It's pretty hard. Yeah, I don't well, know. Well, no, I actually, have any for the words. audience listening at home, it's not that hard. Everyone can, can try. Yeah. Anyone has ordinals. Yeah. So basically, you need a Bitcoin Core wallet. You need to have Bitcoin Core synced on your computer. Right. Which we did an episode where we sunk a Bitcoin we did. Core node. You can, yeah, you can watch that one if you need to learn how yep. for ordinal bounty three. Yep. And then you run the Ord wallet, um, and you can use Ord wallet identify to tell you about. Mm. Uh, what ordinals are in your wallet. And so, yeah, all the details, if you go to docs.ordinal.com or you go to ordinals.com and click on the docs link, uh, that has all the bounties listed there. And that's D-O-C-S. D-O-C-S. Not where you dox everyone in their ordinals. No, 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 no. <laughs> The list where you just keep everyone who's ever submitted an ordinal and you dox them. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. Sorry. I'm doing a doing propaganda against yeah. ordinals right now. That's right. I mean, propaganda with against ordinals is going to come. Yeah. Like once ordinals, once ordinal arts starts taking up a significant percentage of Bitcoin blocks. Yeah. Then things are going to get really spicy. Yeah. Are you ready? Not yet. Yeah, no, I think so. I'm I'm getting into the like all publicity is good publicity. Mindset. Like, mindset. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one time where you said something in an episode where you were joking and you said like uh like yeah, I'm using ordinals to blah blah blah. I don't remember, but I was like, Oh, I'll remember this someday for mm -hmm. like when it gets clipped. For mm -hmm. like, look, he's admitting it. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, someday. Yeah. But you know, for today, you just dox me on the pod and maybe two or three people figure out who I am and uh you know, we live, we live our lives <laughs> unperturbed. Yeah. Um, is that all for ordinals? Yeah, that's all for ordinals. Okay, well, participate uh, oh yeah, in Ordinal Bounty 3. Ordinal Bounty 3, ordinals.com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next announcement. Uh, we will be at Pack Bitcoin next week. That's right. Yeah, this episode goes up, I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. And then the week after, like a week later, we're flying to LA mm -hmm. and we're actually attending Pack Bitcoin. Yeah, we bought tickets we to have Pack tickets. Bitcoin. Yeah. Or you managed. <laughs> <laughs> we have tickets to Pack Bitcoin. We have Bitcoin. tickets to Pack Bitcoin that we had obtained in totally normal, legal ways. 
that is true. Um, but yeah, I'm a, a media personnel. Yeah. For the first time, this is a step up, right? I know. This is our first, like, I feel like this is our first, like, uh, 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 like hell money podcast freebie that we've like yeah. obtained. Yeah. Just me, not you. Not me. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a Thanks for not asking for two media passes. I actually did. For your best buddy. Casey. I actually did. Cause I sent in a request and I was like, Hey, me and my podcast host. And then they were like, we don't give a shit about you. Mm. And then it took more nudging yeah. for them to give a shit about me. <laughs> but only me, not you. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's you already okay. had a ticket. At that I can point. exist in your shadow. Yeah. I mean, I exist in your shadow in other ways, you know, so I can be the media person and you can just be the ordinals guy. Sounds good. Yeah. Someday you'll be like VIP whale, whatever. And I'll be media. I'm never paying for a whale ticket. You were a whale at Bitcoin Miami this last year. Yeah, so maybe no episode next week. Yeah, maybe no episode next week because we're just going to you know, be traveling. First skipped episode. Yep. Feel kind of bad. It's like a 20 episode. Longer than 23 20. episode streak. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's hard, but I, I'm hoping that we'll come out of Pack Bitcoin with a bunch of good interviews. Mm -hmm. So that'll make up for it. And yeah, if you're going to be at Pack Bitcoin, if you're going to be up. in LA, hit us up. Yep. Um, yeah, we're, we're down to hang. We're just going to, to get the West Coast Bitcoiner vibes. Yep. Um, cool. Is that all our announcements? Uh, yeah. Okay. So we... starting with sort of the vibe check, uh, yeah, this is the vibe check episode. Well, I mean, there's, there's the, there's the Ethereum censorship, which Ooh. I feel like we should talk about, Yeah. which yeah. is, I think is part of the vibe check episode. Yeah. I mean, all of everything on the agenda is basically a vibe check. Yep. Um, so Ethereum, if you look at recent Ethereum blocks, 65% of them are censored are OFAC compliant. So what does that mean? Yeah, so what that means is that, I forget what the OFAC is, I believe it stands for the Office of Foreign Asset Control, something like that. And they are a US federal government agency that puts out uh, blacklists of people, individuals, countries, and companies that are forbidden to interact with. Mm -hmm. And among other things, they also publish some Ethereum addresses of people that you're not allowed to inter interact with. And they're the government agency, I believe, that designated the Tornado the tornado Cash Ethereum uh, mixing contract as being forbidden to okay. interact with. Yeah. So Ethereum has this thing called MEV, which is minor extractable value. Mm -hmm. And MEV is the amount of money that miners can make by gaming the order of transactions in a block, right? Like if they see you making a purchase on a DeFi, you know, market maker, um, they will, uh, they can go, they can front run you and they can buy what you were buying before you buy it with a good price, with a better price than you would buy it. So then they sell it to you and you wind up paying more and they sort of get some of your profit. They skim some, some of your profit. And there is a, it's hard to look for MEV opportunities. So there is a relay which produces sort of blocks for miners to accept called MEV Boost. Mm. And MEV Boost is incredibly su successful and they produce like 70, 60, I think like 65% of the blocks that are accepted that, that Ethereum, Ethereum validators mine, I guess they're not mined anymore, that they validate or that they produce, mm -hmm. come from the MEV Boost relay mm -hmm. because it, gives people the best opportunity, the best, uh, make allows miners to make the most MEV. Sure. And, uh, the, these relays, MEV boost and a few others are, uh, OFAC compliant. Okay. They will not include, uh, OFAC banned transactions in the blocks that they give to miners. That Why is that? Like, is that because they're like, Guys, we really don't want to do like what is their reasoning? Because that seems like something that would be really unpopular for one sort of entity to make. Yeah, like I don't exactly know what the reasoning is. I think that they believe maybe that they have to. Right. They're not. They're like a, I believe that they're like a VC backed company. Okay. And they probably via talking to their lawyers have been told that they their relay, they can't produce these candidate blocks that contain banned OFAC transactions. And so they don't. Okay, so it's a product of like the service that they're offering makes it more profitable for like whatever, not miners, but whoever. Validators. validators Ethereum validators. To validate. 
And so they use this service, yep. but the service sort of has this like centralizing effect because yep. it's like, if you use this service, then it's like one point of them just to be like, well, it's like not really financially viable for yep. us to do this. Like they're an easy target, yep. whatever. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And what do the Ethereans think about this? Nothing. Uh, they're surprisingly mute. I would say surprisingly mute. I think they're always mute. Like I yeah. never. I feel like I never really. This 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 is this was big for me to see. Like I I was surprised at how bad it had gotten. Like, like looking very at very fast. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Sixty five percent of blocks being censored. Like the reason why I say surprisingly mute is because if this was happening on a on Bitcoin, I would my opinion would be that Bitcoin was in the process of failing. Like yeah. Bitcoin is failing. And if this gets worse, Bitcoin will have failed. And this is a crisis that must be averted. I can't remember what my, my friend Caroline, uh, she did like a whole astrological analysis of the Ethereum merge. And I'm pretty sure she thought that Ethereum was like pretty much over by December. Really? Yeah. Wow. Cause yeah. I was like, I don't know how long it's going to take for like this to actually matter. And she mm-hmm. was like, mm. Merge astrology is not looking good. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so yeah. maybe the timeline is continuing according to, uh, to astrological analysis. It's pretty wild. I, I can't believe it's this bad. And I, I've, we've sort of been going to some like NFT, <laughs> yeah. uh, web three events to like check out the vibes on the other side. We're of vibe the... checking all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> and I have, I don't think I've talked to anybody who said anything about it. I was drunk. And did you remember when I was drunkenly talking to that guy about it? I don't know. You which which been... event? uh the like halloween party on saturday there no. was some guy oh yeah at, i remember yeah, yeah what, no, I remember. I remember what was going on but i was like trying to explain to him i was like that doesn't have the power to resist censorship mm-hmm. and like he was kind of being like oh i don't really think about that kind of thing like i don't know yeah i don't remember exactly how that conversation went but i just remember him being like not not unconvinced by my argument, but kind of just like not really understanding why I was like autistically spewing like right. things about censorship to him. Like, I think he was just kind of like, why does this like matter? And I was sort of being like, well, then what's even the point of what's happening right now? Like what is, but it's like, I guess we were at a fucking NFT Halloween party. So I that's, should have known. Honestly though, that's kind of that the general attitude that I've found among, among yeah. people in Ethereum and web three, they, I mean, they're, they're very much driven by incentives. Everybody's kind of driven by different incentives and the in- incentives of people in web three and Ethereum are to work for VC backed startups that yeah. dump tokens on retail. And so they're, nobody's telling them like, listen, you need to be super censorship resistant. They're telling them like, you need to make something really shiny and yeah. really confusing so that people will buy it. And any flaws in the system, especially flaws in decentralization, you just need to paper over and, and ignore. Yeah. And a lot of things are like that. Like, I mean, you know, optimism, uh, these like a, th- a lot of Ethereum rollups, they, they're still single points of failure. Like there's mm-hmm. one key that can, tr- that's like the contract upgrade key. And, uh, that, you know, the huge amounts of money essentially in these like centralized choke points. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think they just don't think about that because that's not really where the money or the social, social cred is pointing them to. Yeah. The social cred is just coming up with like complicated moon math that doesn't work. I mean, the social cred feels a little bit devoid, honestly. I mean, we, yeah, as you said, we, <laughs> NFT San Francisco was this last weekend yep. and, um, we did not get tickets to that. Obviously we're not about to pay money for that, but we did go to free side events and other side events. And, um, yeah, the, I mean, it was mostly, I was just curious, like what is NFT land like now in like a bear market? And I do just feel like it's not even that like the vibes are like, um, like they're like, woo, like great Gatsby, like twenties partying, even though like the great recession is about, it's like, it feels like, it's just over kind of, and it's mm. not very much excitement yeah. in the f- situation in general. Yeah. We didn't go to the event. I'm curious what the event was like, but yeah, the, the actual... side parties, the side parties didn't have much like juice. No, you know, no. And it was like a Saturday. Like it should have been like, if there was a night for it to be like, okay, yeah, like let's party. We love NFTs. Yeah. Did we just pick the wrong parties to go to? I don't think so. I think, <laughs> okay, well, so, so like that night. So the story of that night which I, I wrote in my notes, NFT SF slash San Francisco vibe check. It was a mm-hmm. vibe check on both NFTs and San Francisco. So we were like, okay, let's, let's go to these events. Like Saturday night, there were like a couple in a row. We were like, let's show up like, and just like 
see what the deal is and and see what people are thinking about and like get a sense for like what are people even like doing here and we go to the first event and it's like a nft art gallery and there's like a line outside we showed up like 30 minutes after it was supposed to start or maybe even an hour after it was supposed to start. And we were like, what's going on? And they were like, oh, they're having technical difficulties. Like they're not letting anyone in until they like figure out the technical difficulties. And Casey like walks up to the window to look in and they're like screwing screens onto like a mount. Literally like- <laughs> just like screwing a, a screen mount, like the kind of mount like that you would TV. see. <laughs> yeah, like a TV mount for displaying things in the gallery. And I assumed I saw that and I was like, wow, there must be like, <laughs> 20 of these mounts that they're they there must be a lot of these mounts that they're like screwing together like okay this maybe this is going to take a while right so we left so we left well okay so like also it's like it's funny because it's like if it was just an art gallery like not an nft gallery but just like print out the nft like that would have just been like set up you know what i mean but Mm -hmm. like the fact that they needed to like screw on all the screens to the mounts like it's like that is like the essence of what an NFT, like how the fact that they can't physically display NFT is like on time in an art gallery opening is like, pfft. yeah, a little problematic. Yeah. So then we leave. We're like, OK, this doesn't seem like whatever. Like, we're not going to wait out here. Let's just like go get like food or like a drink somewhere. Um, and we're in the Tenderloin of San Francisco. So it's rough out here. Tenderloin market area. Halloween weekend. Yeah. Middle of eclipse season. Saturday night. It's getting dark out. We start walking to just like, you know, whatever we're looking on like Google maps and just being like, okay, we can go to this place. It's open. So we walked probably like three or four blocks, maybe not that far. I saw at least three human feces. Yeah. Like, or hufies as I like to call it. <laughs> hufies. Three dodging hufies left and right. <laughs> like we literally were, I was being like, oh, careful. Like don't sit there. Like it was so much just. It was pretty apocalyptic. It was very apocalyptic. Obviously, like people are just like milling around, like drugged out on the street. And we're just like, damn, okay. And we like pull up to whatever the place that we had found. And they're like, do you have a reservation? And I'm like, there's literally human feces out on the street. And you're (laughs) asking us if we have a reservation? Like, no, we don't have a fucking reservation. We get in and it's like a totally like it's like an isolated vibe. Like Mm -hmm. it's like out on the street there's like 200 people like just milling around milling around being high yeah being high smearing the shit around (laughs) literally (laughs) and then inside is like this weird like manufactured like service lounge experience Mm -hmm. everything was so wildly overpriced like the cocktails were like 20 something dollars like yeah Cocktail was really good though. It was really good. It was very good. It was pretty good. It was good. (laughs) (laughs) Had a bitter Giuseppe. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So then we go back to whatever. Yeah. That experience is what it is. That's San Francisco. Like that is like just what San Francisco fucking is. And we go back to the NFT event and they're, they're open and there's like 10 people and like 10 people are less in there and there's just two screens. Yeah. There's two screens. It took them literally like an hour and a half to (laughs) screw together two screens and to put two monitors on those like screwed together screen mounts that just sort of displayed a rotating set of shitty (laughs) MFTs. That they weren't even touchscreens, and they had what looked like giant yeah, touchscreen controls. They had like it was like it wasn't even like full screened. It was like you yeah. could still see like the like kind of the whatever. navigation bar. And like Casey like tried to like click X, and it was like just not a touchscreen. <laughs> it, it was bad. Extremely strong NGMI vibe. Extremely str- so from- that's yeah. That's why I say like it's not even like the Ethereum people feel like they're like not paying attention. It's like. They're just, I don't know. I think maybe they're just like in hiding yeah, or like retreated. Well, NFTs are really That's true. hurt, it's, it's hurt a marginalized, by the bear market. Yeah, marginalized community in this bear market. Like, I mean, I think that the open sea volume is down like 99%. <sighs> yeah. But, you know, one nice thing is I think artists are, artists will keep NFTs going. Yeah. Because artists are used to, for a long time, making art and not getting paid. Yeah. And so they were getting paid with NFTs. And even if they are once again, not getting paid, that's just back to the status quo and they'll still be like out out here, like making their NFTs and like making art and like selling it to like a small group of, 
of of collectors. Yeah, I mean, you know, the artist that we talked to was like probably my favorite person we talked to. He was very chill. Yeah, he seemed very normal. Very chill, very normal. Also, very like upfront and honest. Like just kind of being like, yeah, I don't really know what the deal is with this. I just like, you know, I do. He do, he makes digital art too, so he's like, it's a logical thing for me to do, and I just wanted. To, use whatever platform is like the easiest with like a market that's available to me, Mm -hmm. you know, um, which feels like the most just like honest, uh, answer in the NFT world to get, Mm -hmm. as opposed to people being like, this is the future. Someday you're going to be buying your hat for the metaverse Mm -hmm. with my NFTs, you know? Um, I don't know. Is it worth like, then we went to a party and I, yeah, whatever. Party, which was the Bay area apes, which are, (laughs) they're these sort of like, they're not, they don't look exactly like board ape club, but they're clearly inspired by board ape club. Yeah. They're like sort of Bay area, like hip hop and sports apes. Yeah. And they're, Maybe the shittiest, like cringiest. They were so nice. The, they were lovely. They, they were, were lunch so lovely. Nice. But They're the, entrepreneurs. The apes are very cringy. <laughs> Extreme levels of cringe. Well, it didn't. I didn't connect the dots. That it was interesting. Like they used these NFTs <clears throat> as like um, as like a way of like establishing status in like a club. Right. Like you like have this NFT and you get like these privileges, like bottle service at right. the club. It's which, basically a way of conferring hot girl status right. on lame guys. Yeah. Which I've, we've said it before. Like this is the Holy grail of NFTs. hundred percent. If you can con- con- confer hot girl status on like lame, lame men, phew, you've cracked that nut. But this is a code that I don't think NFTs can crack. Like, what do you need an NFT? Because then afterward, I guess I, I talked to this guy and I was like, oh, he's so nice. He's like, well-meaning. Like, you know, he's just trying to do it. He's like, we want to start a club. We, you know, he wants to, I guess this is the whole thing with the Web3 people. They have this like vision that's like not necessarily like hellish or bad. Mm-hmm. It just is sort of like, like, I don't know. I left that conversation being like, that guy's nice. Like, whatever. And then I kind of was like, but why is this an NFT at all? Mm-hmm. Like, why not just like have a list? Yeah, I don't like, know. I don't, what is even the reason to have it be an NFT? I think maybe you it's know? that NFTs are sort of like displayable in a central place. Like I you guess. can have your little gallery of NFTs that you display. And so it's sort of like a status good. Whereas if you just had, you know, you were a member of some club mm-hmm. and maybe you could go to that club's website and like see your name that doesn't have the appeal of something that you can display publicly in like whatever context you, you But want. do people want their name displayed that shows that they paid for status at a club? I feel like you just want to be at the club. Uh, yes, I think people do want this. Like for Ooh. example, like Bored Apes, yeah. like people, the whole point is to flex your Bored Ape That's on your true. Twitter profile. That's true. Right, to include it as your Twitter profile. Yeah, I guess this is just, it's just flex culture. I just don't get it. I don't get flexing culture. Yep. But I don't disrespect it. Like, I have to say, like, honestly, I feel like that's the thing that people, like, give NFT people the most shit about. And I kind of, they're into what they're into, you know? Yeah, I don't, I'm not into it, but I don't begrudge them their flex yeah, culture. Yeah, it was you know? fine. They yeah. were nice. They were nice. It was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so that was our time at NFT San Francisco. Um, And just overall, I mean, the vibe... Well, okay, so this past week, there were two major San Francisco uh, current events stories. Mm -hmm. The first is Elon buying Twitter, rolling up and being like, everyone get the fuck out of here. I'm going to... I don't even know what he's going to do. He's going to run Twitter like it's a startup. I guess. Which is going to be a, a shock to the pants of the geriatric giant tech company that Twitter has become like yeah. imagine like you're some engineer at Twitter and for the past like eight years you've just been coasting like nobody really cares the company's right. making money like nothing is really connected to like performance or reality mm-hmm. and then Elon comes in and goes like look you you need to work 12 hour days until we like ship this feature like yeah he's he brought in employees from Tesla to make Twitter employees do code reviews with he said that he wanted Twitter employees to print out all the code that they had written in the last 30 days and bring it to him to like review together. That's like, he's insane. That's awesome. Honestly. Yeah. I have realized throughout this, I don't know when it happened. I don't know if it was him or if it was me, but I do find Elon hot now. Oh, really? Interesting. And I didn't before. Huh? And I don't, am I like, is it because of this? Does Mm. he like, did he get work done? Like, I don't know what it, but, Something about it is like I think doing it's it just his increased power and like uh, <laughs> dynamism, you know. 
the I charged eroticism <laughs> of the pure I don't think capitalistic it's power. power. I don't think it's power because he has power. He's like the richest dude. Like mm-hmm. it's. I think it's that he doesn't give a fuck. Like he's just like coming in here and being like, mm, "I'm gonna try this." Like he doesn't understand how like anything works. Like I don't think he cares. Exactly. That's what yeah. I mean. Like he really doesn't give a fuck. Like I don't think he bought Twitter to like make it profitable or even like a good company i think he like bought twitter because like he was kind of like oh i don't like that they're doing this meaning like removing trump from twitter and being like okay maybe i could just go in and like make them not do that you know i guess i kind of disagree i think he he like thinks twitter is like kind of awful and is like i've got to be able to do way better and he likes twitter he likes tweeting he likes shit posting so that's true and that, that is how we all feel i think like I feel like everyone likes shit posting and they miss how Twitter used to feel. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, I feel like that's probably what it is. Is me seeing Elon go in there and just like fuck it up. I'm mm-hmm. like, can it be worse than it is right now? Like no. probably not. And Twitter's a company. It's kind of amazing how bad they are. Like yeah. they just, nothing works. It's kind mm-hmm. of weird. The The spam problem is insane on crypto Twitter. Yeah. Every time I mention Bitcoin or like NFTs or whatever, I get dozens of like spam comments. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's really bad. I mean, and it's just, it's also an interesting chapter in, you know, the January 6th Trump being banned from Twitter story. Mm -hmm. Like that was January, 2021. So that's a long ass time ago now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was like, that was, I think the catalyst for like this whole like free speech, like Twitter, blah, blah, blah. I want Elon to come in and like mm. bring Trump back. Like, mm-hmm. is Elon going to bring Trump back? You know, I wonder that would be wild. He might not do that just for the heat that it would bring to him. But I kind of, I don't know why, but what heat? like people want that. I don't know. I th- no, I well, I don't know. I feel I think feel like a lot of people don't want that. Yeah, a but it doesn't people. seem like Elon cares about those people. True. Like <laughs> Yeah, true. And from a numbers perspective, you want Twitter to do numbers like shit, bring exactly. Trump back. Exactly. No, I think he's gonna bring Trump back. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, you right. Like I, I think it's like all of this is happening during eclipse season, so it's really hard to say like exactly what the fuck is going on. Just for the listeners, eclipse season is October twenty fifth through November eighth. What happens during eclipse season? Um, there's two eclipse, like there's like the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. And do they usually happen together? They do happen. They happen during like the same cycle because it has to do with like the way that the plane of the earth's rotation is aligned with the plane of like earth's ro- like revolving around the, the sun. axial tilt. Right. So the, the new and full moon of that cycle are both eclipses just because Wait, the which moon cycle? is. What cycle? Uh, like. I just mean like the moon cycles like every 28 days, uh-huh. right? So that's like one moon cycle. Then it has uh, a new moon and a full moon. Uh-huh. And when earth is like aligned correctly with the moon and the sun where they all line up, I see. then both right. moon events, one mm-hmm. of them is a lunar eclipse, which is when like the moon is a full moon and it's on the other side of earth. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is a solar eclipse, which is when like the moon is on the sun side. Right. So earth. that 28 day period is eclipse season. Well, it's like a 14 day. It's between the two basically. Oh, gotcha. So it's like half a, <laughs> but like during, like between those two events, it's like, whoa, like obviously those are the two peaks but Mm -hmm. it's like you know both of those Mm -hmm. two chaotic events happen and it's every six months Mm -hmm. pretty much so i think actually we started the podcast during last eclipse season oh okay yeah it's been like six months of hell money pod congratulations thank you yeah congratulations to you too um but yeah eclipses are like supposed to be chaotic external events that like come in and change your situation so there's nothing you can really do to avoid Mm. them and that's also why like historically they're like thought to be like bad omens because it's like it's generally not good Mm -hmm. like but i don't think it has to be bad Mm. but it is chaotic so like elon yeah i feel like elon buying twitter and all of this happening during Mm. eclipse season i'm like it's kind of yet to be i wonder if that's why there was so much human feces on the streets of San Francisco. Yeah. I like, mean, do you think it peaks around eclipse season? <laughs> <laughs> that's like the next scientific, that's the next chapter of my PhD thesis. Mm, yeah. Correlating <laughs> human feces in San Francisco to moon events, mm. you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's partially why it felt so weird in San Francisco, like just like fucking crazy out there. What can we expect for Bitcoin during this, uh, this eclipse season? I don't know. I don't know that it's like particularly, I mean, I guess last eclipse season, when did like the bear market start? June ish? Maybe something like that. Yeah. I feel like it, I feel like it's not super related to Bitcoin price. I think Bitcoin price is like more related to outer planet stuff, like uh, age of Aquarius ass shit. And that makes sense. It's been really stable. It hasn't been going up and down on the order of, you know, the eclipse season. Yeah. I feel like the eclipses have more to do with like 
uh, like politics or like war or like create like, like events Mm -hmm. less. So like, like Bitcoin price action is like kind of more of like a gradual process. Usually it happens like over a period of time. I feel like eclipses are more like Paul Pelosi getting attacked in his San Francisco home, Mm, which we should also talk about, which we should also talk about because that also has to do with the San Francisco vibe check. Paul Paul Pelosi, is he related to somebody famous? (laughs) Someone we might know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Um, What do you, I mean, do you, have you looked into this story at all? No, I haven't. I can't decide what I I try not to pay attention to politics. Well, it's like intrigue. Yeah. Like but this isn't even really Paul. This is Paul Pelosi. He's not a politician. So what happened? Paul Pelosi. So Paul Pelosi, there was a 911 call and Paul Pelosi, I guess, called 911. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think that's the story. I've heard like different things. Um, but basically like some guy was attacking Paul Pelosi with a hammer in his San Francisco home. Mm-hmm. According to the official story, he was saying like, where's Nancy? And so this is being framed as like, this like MAGA guy who's like radicalized and like broke into their home and like attacked Paul Pelosi. Lots of people feel like that's bullshit. Did, did, is there any evidence that it was some, Oh, the person, the person who attacked the had screamed, where's Nancy? That's Pelosi? that. Yeah. Where's that's Nancy? the idea. Okay, got um, it. But like the guy, he lives in Berkeley. Um, mm-hmm. the guy who attacked Paul Pelosi and he seems like a lib, like he doesn't seem like a MAGA guy. Uh, I mean, if you got an extreme lib, he probably hates establishment. Democrats totally but yeah. that that doesn't make you MAGA oh yeah totally you yeah, know yeah, 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 like yeah. agreed yeah but right. yep, yep yep I know but then other people are being like oh no this was actually like Paul Pelosi's gay lover and they just had a lover's quarrel and then lover's quarrel where he hit him in the head with a with a hammer <laughs> yeah yeah and he called 911 I don't know you know it's like it's a whole it's a whole fucking thing but I think it's like both that story and the Elon Twitter story I feel like speak to like the technocracy and like the chaos of the technocracy taking over from the gerontocracy. Cause it's like, as you were saying, like imagine you're just like some software engineer at Twitter that's just been coasting for like eight years, just like being like, whatever, like Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you don't really have to do anything. And then all of a sudden this like fucking meme Lord comes in, who's like the richest man in the world and just is like, I'm just going to shake things up. You guys, like Uh I'm just going to change everything. And like all of a sudden you're out of a job and it's like all this shit, same situation, Paul Pelosi, hanging out in his like pack heights home, just like vibing. And he gets like attacked by, you know, some internet radical. Basically yeah. they feel like the same energy, like mm. both stories. Yeah. Very eclipse season, very eclipse season. And I think the fact that like no one really knows what the true story is, like in the Paul Pelosi situation, it's like, was he, did this person break in and he was attacked or like, is it some other, you know, not so great story for Paul Pelosi. And then with the Twitter thing, the fucking guys that were like outside pretending to be fired Twitter employees. Yeah. That was really impressive. (laughs) Rahul, uh, Rahul Ligma and Daniel Johnson, (laughs) not their real names. Ligma and Johnson. Yeah. Growing Daniel on Twitter, a pretty epic Twitter presence. Uh, he is, he really is. He, I don't even think he works at Twitter. He, uh, when like the, the, the Twitter shakeup was happening, he got like a box full of junk and like just must have milled around outside of Twitter headquarters, like being a like guy getting fired, pretending to be a guy getting fired for journalists until Fox News like <laughs> talked to him. And he just gives like this unhinged interview where he's like, yeah, I own a Tesla, but like, I don't know how I'm going to make payments on it. Like, <laughs> Sorry, guys, I got to go. I need to check in with my husband and wife. <laughs> It's so awesome. Yeah, I was impressed. I mean, that was some like legendary That's king That's genius. Shit. Yeah. yeah. But this is what I'm saying. Like we... And he fed them the narrative that they wanted to hear. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like it's just all of this. It just feels like... Yeah, it's hyper normalization vibes, which if you haven't seen the documentary, hyper normalization, Adam Curtis, it's an essential watch. Um, but yeah, it feels like all of these stories, it's like there's not even like a real like solid fact base like there's no real perspective to take and be like this is what happened like i know that like elon's coming in and he's like firing x y and z and he's gonna bring trump back or like whatever the fuck the story is with elon like literally nobody fucking knows elon probably doesn't even know paul pelosi who the fuck knows what happened to paul pelosi like we're never gonna know like i feel like with any of this like i feel like the media cycle just like 
It's pretty weird. I do feel like, yeah, nobody knows really what's going to happen next. Yeah. Like all yeah. of like 2018 to 2022 was just like, wow, holy shit. One thing after another. Literally. Like, is it just going to be like that forever where shit is just wild on a monthly basis? Well, this is why I always ask you, like, did it used to be? Like no, <laughs> it was so simple before. The 90s. God, what a blessed, simple time. <laughs> Capitalism was just kind of ripping. Yeah. All was well in the world. We watched Jurassic Park, you know. I feel like people were not happy in the 90s. What about like Kurt Cobain? Yeah, I mean, there's always a few Wasn't there like are... a nihilism of the 90s? Like the 90s doesn't strike me as this like happy-go-lucky time. It strikes me as like a well, nihilistic sort of... I was pretty of... miserable just because I was miserable <laughs> when I was a kid. But uh, a lot of people talk about the 90s as this like simple golden age where like everything yeah. kind of made sense and like the economy was doing good and we weren't we were pretty far away from a bunch of like housing crises or like crazy, mm. uh, economic crises. There hadn't, there weren't any economic crises during the nineties. Terrorism wasn't a big deal. You Y2K know? was looming though. Y2K was looming. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Y2K happened and then like just stuff started popping off. Are you uh, a nineties kid? Like by definition? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I was, I was born in 83. So, you know, the oldest I was during the eighties was seven so yeah. really yeah you are like a 90s kid for sure do you yeah. think that that's the best like do you think you had the best like time to be alive hard for me to say because i was just miserable i was yeah, miserable and depressed it. yeah nothing about the 90s seemed particularly good what's been the best time to be alive so far in your life uh probably when i studied abroad in sweden <laughs> and like all i was doing was was practicing swedish like trying to learn swedish and partying mm. and it was this really interesting combination of i was I'm not really much of a partier, mm -hmm. but there I was partying and it had this incredible like intellectual challenge to it because oh, I'd, like, I like, you were trying to speak Swedish. Yeah. I would go out and try to speak Swedish and it was like a huge challenge to like remember words. And like I, every time I interacted with somebody, I would learn a word. I would learn like a new way to say something. Mm -hmm. And so it gave just partying with a bunch of Swedes, this incredible like additional layer to it. Yeah. And you've used that for the rest of your life. Like I can't even count how many times you've like, fun fact, did you know that blah, blah, blah in Swedish? Is <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's actually incredibly annoying. But it is a big part of your personality. It is yeah, a big part of my personality. <laughs> What's the fucking elbow one where you hit your funny bone? Oh yeah. Bone? When you hit your funny bone, that's called the widow shock. That's one of the best Tell Money podcast moments. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll play a clip from the archives yeah, uh, right yeah. now. No, actually, I, the theme of this episode is you have to go back through the archives yourself. Okay, if right. You yeah, want, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you want any of these moments. Um, yeah, I did actually have a note is now the best time to be alive because I was thinking about it. Yeah, it's weird. I feel like in a lot of ways our material conditions keep getting better and better, more or less. Mm -hmm. Technology keeps getting better and better. But and this is really going to, this is really going to sound like taking a page from the book of, from the book of Aaron, mm -hmm. but like spiritually, right? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> it seems like people are very anxious. A lot of the narratives are really bad. We're yeah. sort of in, in crisis, these crises that we create, you know, like these like political crises, economic crises, um, environmental crises. Not that that's fully you know, man created, but we're very much swept we're in the swept drama up of by that. It. Yeah. I've been reading culture of narcissism by Christopher Lash. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, mm -hmm. um, it was written in the seventies. Mm -hmm. Oh, are you checking? Yeah. We're about 45 minutes in. Nice. There you go. Um, it was written in the seventies. Uh, and it was like, people like point to it now just being like, wow, it like really predicted our time. Kind of like sovereign individual vibes. Uh -huh. yep. Um, but basically his kind of point and he's not like being like, a lot of conservatives kind of point to him as being like, look, like he was right, but he's not really a conservative. Mm -hmm. um, but his kind of thing is like the, de the degradation of like family values and community mm -hmm. over like the course of the sixties into the seventies has led to a culture of narcissism where all anyone has is themselves. Mm. And like that hasn't created like a rugged individual that like goes out and like does what they want. It's created like a bottomless pit that doesn't know how to find meaning or, uh, like looks to things like therapists to tell them like how to live their lives because they don't have like family to do that or like culture to like kind of give them a path. Mm -hmm. And so they like hyper intellectualize like and therapize like everything. And they also have to like, he also says like this creates 
the political drama because like for the narcissist everything that happens external to the narcissist is like furthering the narcissist plot Mm -hmm. and so like all of these like political events or like media stories like contribute to the narcissist like formation of self and so we become obsessed with like apocalyptic narratives and like things that create meaning or like rage or like intense emotions in our life because Mm -hmm. we like don't have a base outside of ourselves with which to like learn to value ourselves Mm -hmm. so i feel like and he says like yeah like the 70s was like the decade that this happened and then like going in you know obviously he's just what, gotten what happened worse. in the 70s what's his what does he think set it off well so like the 50s was like the family right that was like very like suburban home like mom stay-at-home mom vibes and then the 60s was kind of like this retaliation but it was very political it was mm-hmm. very like much about movements but then the disillusionment that happened in, from the 60s into the 70s was like when people realized like maybe we can't change things politically and so they just retreated into like the self and like making politics or like those sort of like social justice movements more of like an identity rather than like a thing that you are like pushing forward and contributing to so the 70s was like it's like called like the decade of me where like people started creating like um like political rebelliousness as like a style or like an Hmm. identity rather than being like i'm contributing to this movement Mm -hmm. and like i who i am is sort of separate from that Mm -hmm. but rather being like you know whatever things in the bio that like yeah say like your political affiliation and that defines you if you i mean i don't know if this is true just because i don't know enough about it Mm -hmm. but if you told me that something like this was true that like oh yeah back in the Back in the 60s or 70s, we made a few wrong choices in how society's organized. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. And it's the source of a lot of our problems. I'd be like, yeah. Sounds yeah, about right. Sounds about right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a well-written book, too. It's just, I think it's like, it's satisfying to read it now. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, again, it has sovereign individual vibes because it's like satisfying to read it now and see like, mm-hmm. like, he couldn't have predicted like reality TV yeah. or social media, which are like it is true exemplifying that, yeah. of that for sure. Family structure has changed enormously. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not somebody who's like, oh my God, you know, the family being torn apart. But like, it is true that like, you know, people are having fewer children. People are having children later. It's not as like normal and expected. I feel like mm-hmm. it was pretty normal to have kids in your 20s. You know, that was totally normal. That's just what people did. Mm -hmm. Um, and now obviously people can like, you know, it's much easier to control your fertility as a couple. Right. Um, and not that that's obviously that's probably in and of itself a good thing, Mm -hmm. but I could imagine that that has knock on effects. You know, people are forming families later. It's not as expected. It's not as normal. They're spending more time alone or not really, you know, in service to something sort of larger and real. Well, right. what is larger, you know, like without family, culture and religion, like right. what is larger and more real than just like whatever the fuck is booping around in your brain? Yeah. I mean, this is something you know? that I struggle with <laughs> like all the time. I mean, like for me, like, yeah, like the thing that is booping around in my brain is kind of the thing that's most important to me. You're like ordinals. You know? ordinals. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of like my strat for coping with reality is like, I find something to get really obsessed with. Yeah. And if you ask me, I like, Oh, do our ordinals meaningful in some sort of grand sense? Or like, is Bitcoin meaningful in some sort of grand sense? I'm like, well, no, it's just kind of what I'm obsessed with at the moment. Actually, although I don't know, Bitcoin ties into a lot of my, like, even though I'm not a religious person, I have a lot of ideas. I have sort of like pretty strong value system. Yeah. Like what I think is good and what I think is bad. Why do you think, what do you think that's based on? Just like feel, uh, like hating, kind of hating authority. So it's a fear based. No, mentality. it's not fear. It's not fear. <laughs> Casey said defensively. Um, no, it's like, I've just always hated authority mm-hmm. whenever anybody I've, I, whenever anybody has tried to like exert control over me in a way that I didn't appreciate, or I have seen somebody else having control taken away from them. I've had an extremely negative visceral reaction to right. that. I basically have never thought that any kind of authority was justified whatsoever. Um, In my like, in my, you know, uh, like hardcore, like 13 to like 17 year old, like the atheist period. Yeah. (laughs) Casey, 90s atheist. 90s kid Casey. Yeah. I I remember I would be like, yeah, if I died and there was a God, like the first thing I'd ask him was what makes you right? (laughs) Like that kind of goes with like everything. Boo. Boo. But yeah, like I, I just hate authority. And so mm-hmm. the things that I value are freedom and 
not being under the jack boot of some thug, right? And so that's why I, I like Bitcoin a lot. Because but then, it, you know, it is like freedom for what, right? Like, it's like, that is still like an anti argument. It's like, once you're free, then like, what's the meaning? That's the thing. Is I, it's, it, that's the thing is I think people do their best figuring when they're free. They do the best things the when slack. they're free. And it doesn't need to be anything in particular. Like, I have I've confidence that when people are th- free, they do useful, good, interesting things. I sort of idealistically agree with you, but I think, like, I feel like having framework is, it might be a cope, but I think it, it, it seems apparent to me that having faith of some kind is, like, intrinsic to humans. Not that every individual human has faith or needs it to survive, but like when you look at history, it's not like there's like historical societies where they're like, yeah, God's just, you know, we don't really know, Mm -hmm. you know, like every society throughout all of history is like, no, we know, we know what what God is and it's this. Yeah. And like, I don't know if that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's, it's the way people are. Yeah. It's like, I think what's interesting to me about like the, yeah, the dissolution of the family, the dissolution of religion, the dissolution of culture, like particularly in America or like Western societies, whatever, is like it feels like this is the first time that this is being tried. And I don't know. I mean, like whatever, like communism, I guess, was technically like an atheist society, but that was like top down approach. Yeah, very coerced. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think I do think frameworks, I do think values, I do think all that stuff is super valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think that people come up with the best frameworks and values when they're not being coerced. People who who are not being coerced when they're free will find something to care about. So They'll this find is yeah. They... So this is what I'm wondering is like, is what will people arrive on? Like right now, like religion, yeah, like these structures that like, I mean, I would say like it is like a lot of religion and family like is coercive. Like not saying that it doesn't add value to your life or like meaning to be like a part of a religious organization or a family or that you can't genuinely believe mm-hmm. it, but it feels like the reason why people are moving away from those things is not, it's like because they don't believe it anymore. And I wonder if that is like a blip and something else will take hold, like fucking astrology or something insane like that. Or if like we actually will be moving forward as like a more atheist society. I don't think so. I think people just kind of like have some sort of like object of devotion and they just swap it out for one thing or another. So what science? Uh, like, I mean, yeah, I describe it as scientism, which yeah. is not actually real science. When I talk to people who would describe themselves as like progressives and know the science and, um, that's what they believe in. They have very little idea about science. whatsoever. Yeah, they yeah. have no idea what science is. They have no idea what science it does. They have no idea what the crises within science are. Yeah. Like the replication crisis in a lot of psychology and medicine. Like how can you really like believe in science if 60% of psychology papers like don't replicate? I know. Right? Like, uh, so they're just clueless. They've just swapped one religion for another. I think it's people need that like objective veneration or need some really black and white value system. Yeah. And so they're just plugging in. Oh, well, I guess, you know, we have telescopes and we can't see God in the heavens. So So he ain't there. He ain't there. But the big bang is. Yeah. Yeah. So just replacing it with something. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, yeah, this is something I talk about a lot with like, yeah, my science, my woke woke science friends meaning like woke in like a real way. Like they're awakened within mm -hmm. science is like, there's no one who's more aggressive about science being real than people who have no fucking idea Absolutely. about and don't work in science. Yeah. Like when you work in science, you're like, whoa, like there's a lot of issues it's here. It's a mess. Incentives are terrible. And that doesn't mean that like empirical reasoning is like dead or not useful or that like having <laughs> some sort of like consensus I mean, scientifically really, is not valuable, but like it has to do with the institutions that exactly, do science. It's just, it's a lot weaker than I think people realize, but it's like, as you said, I, I agree with you. I think people people seem to need something. Mm-hmm. So like what happens like as the institution, like I feel like what happened was like people moved away from religion, family and culture and then yeah. they moved into science. And like what happens as like science becomes more broken obviously there's some people that will just con- they'll do the they'll do I the think like they'll just super- continue to believe in it of course I think they'll, they'll do the super to- crazy christian thing yeah. like that every it's tale as old as time yeah. religious fanatics like obviously but like what about <laughs> what about like people like you you know maybe like be, what about people maybe, that maybe are- i'll become a sikh a sikh yeah i went to a gurdwara 
a few weeks ago, okay. which is like a Sikh worship hall. Mm-hmm. And they have something called uh, Langar. Like every Sikh uh, Gurdwara has Langar, which means kitchen. Mm-hmm. And they just serve people food. It was very chill. It was really chill. I was like, yeah, I can vibe with this. I feel like you are exploring your spirituality in like a non-religious uh, faith-based way. Yeah, well, I enjoy it. Like you're getting your like Orthodox Jew lessons. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I just, I enjoy I like like kind of anything that is above a certain level of complexity, I think is interesting. Right. And like partying with the Swedes, partying with the Swedes, religious traditions, weird subcultures. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the weird like traditions is are in of religion are really interesting to me. Like, well, okay, they believe this. That's not true, but I don't care that it's not true. I'm interested in why that belief came to be and why it persists and etc. Yeah. So maybe you'll just, I mean, maybe you'll just continue exploring and then you will find something that speaks to you or maybe you'll just be a searcher for your whole life. I think I'll just be a searcher. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could, your, I, I would your cross love, to bear. I would love to really go whole hog have on like a religion. A spiritual yeah. Awakening. Have a spiritual awakening. Be like, guys, I found God. I don't think it'd be good for you. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully it'd be a, some sort of God that was like compatible with Bitcoin, you know, that would, I could still be fully obsessed with Bitcoin, but could just be a little bit more sure that there was some kind of afterlife that was like good. You know? Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't mind. Like, I feel like people who are not like spiritually connected, I'm just kind of like, maybe that's just your thing to do in this life. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like you just got to figure out other things. Mm-hmm. Like there's stuff I can't do because I'm just like too lost in the sauce. of like <laughs> <laughs> my own like stupid little stories that I tell myself about how reality works. Mm-hmm. But I also think there's like deeper truths that I see as a result. You know, yeah. it takes like all, it takes all kinds. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I sort of feel like we're in like, a, we're in like a chaotic kind of like reconfiguring. I feel like, yeah, it's, it's some sort of liminal transitory period totally. where things are reconfiguring. Yeah. I also think it's, it's, Eclipse it's season. <laughs> yeah. Well, just in a, the broader arc of like human development, I think that probably we're in a, we're going to get into a post evolution world pretty soon. Right. In terms of our own development, where instead of natural selection, like guiding the evolution of humans, mm-hmm. we're going to start doing some like intentional, like genetic transhumanism. engineering. Yeah. Not, not yeah. even really just transhumanism. I mean, just like sort of, you know, selecting against variants that cause disease, selecting for genetic variants that have certain like beneficial properties. Yeah. Like we're going to do a lot of that. And because evolution operates so slowly, even if we do a little bit of that, we will be in a post evolution world. Right? Well, we're just excel. I mean, I just feel like everything is like accelerating so fast right now, whether it's like technologically or like, yeah, as you said, like evolutionarily, Yeah. like uh, these things or like, you know, climate change even is like an example where yeah. it's like, yeah. this isn't supposed to happen. I'd so be fast. so bummed if you put me into a time machine and you sent me like 200 years into the future and it was basically the same, you know, like if things hadn't really changed very much, that'd yeah. just be lame as hell. There's no way. I hope so. I feel like as far as science goes, like, so I think one of the reasons that science is so fucked up Mm -hmm. is we really picked a lot of low hanging fruit between 1920 and 1980. And like even post 1980, like a lot of it is kind of just like really exploiting the things that we figured out. Right. Like, I mean, microchips came in the seventies, seventies or eighties. Yeah. Like when, I, I don't know when the first microchips were made, but like, yeah, they were definitely around. Yeah. No, the seventies. Yeah. We had sixties and seventies. We had mm-hmm. computers. Although I don't know if we had microchips. I'm sure. Yeah. The PDPs were microchips. So yeah, I think we had microchips in the sixties and seventies, mm-hmm. but so a lot of that technological, what we would describe as the technological digital electronics revolution of the last, you know, 40 years mm-hmm. uh, is actually just exploiting this like one niche that we found a while ago. Yeah. And this is, this is one of my like non, uh, like this is one of my critiques of science. That's like not a problem with science. It's just sort of like a thing that I think is happening is exactly this where it's like, I think there are a lot of like older scientists, like academics that actually have done really great work. Like they're not frauds or phonies or like Mm -hmm. idiots. They've, they've had a respectable career, but I think the things that they discovered or invented or whatever, like it's not as easy to do that anymore. Cause we've kind yeah. of run, as you said, we've run out of the low hanging fruit yeah. and like, but the way that the academic model works is you're just supposed to create like a million more of yourself. Especially, uh, this must be really hard in your field in, uh, I, I mean, yeah, there's nothing left to astronomy, yeah. which is like, that's picked clean. Yeah. Like we can't, because the are, we're really just like, 
yeah, like there are photons and radio waves. There's like electromagnetic radiation hitting Earth. And all we can do is just like observe that electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. We can't like teleport to another planet and do like science experiments No, we experiments can't. There. And we can't go back in time and see how things used to be. We have like yep. one data point effectively. Yep. And it's like right now and it's like a blip. Yeah. And, and it's also falling apart. The whole thing is falling apart at the seams. You yeah. Know? How so? Just like a strong, you know, like dark matter and the Big Bang Theory and all these yeah. kind of things. It's just like, we're just, the more we learn, the more that we're like, oh, maybe we just had this like very simple, like convenient assumption that yeah. helped us create these models that like actually might not be legit I at mean, all. Dark matter in particular is like sad. It's They're like, so... this equation doesn't balance. Yeah. So let's just add this extra, the fudge factor. It should literally be called the fudge factor. Fudge factor that's literally like 99.999%. Yeah. And if that wasn't enough, then there's also dark energy where they're yeah. like, oh, well, there's a fudge factor for energy and mass. Yeah, no, it's really, but this is what made me think of like the, what is like atheism look like? like is atheism a blip and like what happens like to a true atheist like as science falls apart like because i think i wonder i mean it took a lot of the time to develop the like really baroque complexity of of traditional religions yeah and so maybe we're just in the incipient incipient phase of this like scientism like worship this like science and political sort of like conglomerate that people believe in and that in, you know, thousands of years, we'll have incredibly crazy we'll have lore, lore. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you could also like, I, I feel like if you compare it to like, you know, the like major religion revolution and then like the enlightenment happening after that, like that first being like religion, the second being like scientific reasoning or like science mm -hmm. that like by the time the enlightenment happened, people were like, you know, kind of pissed at religion and they were just sort of like, oh, this is like restrictive and like you kind of have to like f do all these fudge things to like make it work like mm -hmm. the earth can't revolve around the sun or like whatever that mm -hmm. type of shit um and maybe we're just like at that next stage with science where like now science is the version of that where they're like well no it's dark energy and it has to be dark energy because like that's what we've decided for like mm. these decades and like yeah. that I don't know that then there will be like this new thing that comes in. That's maybe like, I think there'll be a chaotic falling apart of academia. I think yeah. basically like, I hope so. Academia is it. pretty, <laughs> <laughs> academia is pretty bad. Yeah. Seems like it's getting worse, but we really haven't changed our appetite for funding it and our appetite for considering it high status. Yeah. 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 And if things keep going for like another like 40 years this way, I feel like it's, it's going to, it's heading towards a reckoning. Yeah. This is actually something I was talking about with my mom today that I thought you would like is my, I was talking about Moore's law with her, which is, you know, whatever. It's just the idea that like computer processing chips get smaller and smaller on some mm. rate over time. And like Moore's law is not like an actual scientific law. It's an observational law, right? Like it's just someone was like the IBM guy was like, Oh, like it just seems like these things get smaller. And like, it has consistently been that way for like decades, like since he made that observation. And I asked her, I was like, why do you think that it follows? Like, why do you think Moore's law is valid? Like, why do you think that that actually works? And she was like, I think because it's such a competitive impulse in like the computer, like the companies that make these things or that research these things that there's so much pressure to stay on Moore's law and to be like, our company is on the cutting edge of Moore's law mm -hmm. that it creates this like incentive system that like lasts forever and mm -hmm. like, will just keep accelerating like, like, it's not that, like, Moore's Law is, like, even necessarily real. It's just mm. that, like, if everyone decides that it's real, yeah. then there's so much attention and energy put into making it real. Right. And, like, for contrast, like, NASA, I feel like the problem with NASA, this is not an idea that's mine. It's something I heard from someone else, but feels very true, is, like, in the 60s and 70s, NASA was, like, or mostly 60s, was told what to do by the government. Like, the government was like, put someone on the fucking moon. We need to beat the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And NASA was like, okay. And they put someone on the moon. Right. But now, NASA is completely politically undefined. NASA makes its own rules and its right. own, like, decisions about things. And so it's, the way it works is it's a bunch of scientists come together and they're like, okay, what seems reasonable for us to do over the next decade, mm -hmm. given this money that we know we're going to get from right. the government to do it? And then, like, the scientists are like, well... I feel like I could discover this molecule on Enceladus maybe in the next 10 years mm -hmm. rather than be like, we're going to fucking find aliens in right. the next 10 years yeah. or you're getting your funding fucking cut. Yeah. You know, it's like, just, I agree with you. Like I think recreating the way that we fund science, free marketing the fuck out of science maybe is like a way to, I don't know, figure out what's like actually worthwhile and what's not. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've, we've really meandered this. Yeah. Stuff. Well, I think like, I mean, 
the last thing, the last thing on our list, I think really brings it together, <laughs> right? William Shatner goes to space on a private uh, Amazon rocket. Blue Origin rocket, yeah. Blue Origin rocket with Jeff Bezos. And he's up there and all he says is space filled me with overwhelming sadness. He literally said it felt like a funeral. Like he said he just looked out and it looked like death. I think maybe we should cut the episode right at that point. (laughs) What? Like space filled me with overwhelming sadness. No outro. And then just... Just cut. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think think it'll be good. Yeah. And just have like... Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. If we wanted to really ham it up, we would fade in um, uh, that song, uh, What a Wonderful World. <sighs> yeah. Okay. I'll see. I'll see what feels right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. We did it. Let's do it. Yeah. That was a good episode. That was a good episode. Yeah.